Is that a risk? <laughs> Hello, I'm Greg. I am definitely an alcoholic. Hi, Greg. Hey, Greg. Um, my purpose today in coming here, other than I was told that when you're asked to be a pervert, you say yes. And uh, I was asked to do this. But I actually have a purpose today. And that's what is really my message is that we read what our primary purpose is every meeting. And for 34 years, I never heard that sentence. 34 fucking years. I came in in June 1975, Hilltop in Bellevue, and I was the ripe old age of 16. And my first blackout was when I was 10. And all of those years, and a lot of them were dry. Uh, the first five years, maybe six months, two months, three months, four months. And my alcoholism continued to get terrible until I was suicidal. And um, I was motivated by, I woke up one day and didn't know where I was, which at that point in time was common. And um, I was sitting in this little tea room, it must have been maybe this big. I was in a cot, there was a window. I saw a palm tree. I was thinking, where the fuck are there palm trees in Bellevue? Where the hell am I? And I left this room, walked down this hallway, down these stairs, and here I was with a YMCA in Honolulu. <laughs> and I had no luggage, no money. And I saw it was Monday. The last thing I remember is I was drinking at the Cork and Cleaver in Bellevue on Friday. And I immediately assessed the situation and realized I had no money and he quit, left, right? Because I didn't know if I had to pay somebody for this room I was in. And I was out there on the sidewalk. And these little children were walking by, you know, holding onto the rope with an adult in each end. They were going into the YMCA. And they were beaming, you know, like these only children this age can beam. And I can still remember to this day thinking, I'm never going to feel that again. Never in my life am I going to feel that again. And at that point in time, and this had been five years of going to AA meetings and not being able to stop drinking and thinking that most of you were idiots and, and couldn't drink, nor could you know, you didn't know how to be married, how you have to be in jail. Jesus, you guys are going to help me in some way? Gosh, not likely. And so out there on that sidewalk, I decided I was done. I knew I could not solve my problem. I knew it was just, it was zero doubt. I did not immediately think of going to treatment, going back to AA. My conclusion, which gave me great relief, was to commit suicide. I noticed there's traffic going by, trucks and buses, and I thought, yeah, I'll just jump in front of one of these. And I felt calm, which is really amazing. I had this feeling that I hadn't ever had before. And I thought, well, I've gotta, I gotta do this right now. I can't let them see me I don't want to survive this and be crippled, right? And I thought, just be quiet and then just jump out at the right time. And I was like, yeah. And then a thought came to me. Or I could go to treatment. Maybe I did it wrong. And I turned to my left and there's a phone. We had pay phones back then. There's a payphone right there. And I knew I, who I could call because I'd come into AA with my mother five years over and she was working with Dr. Milo. And so I was like, I'll call. And I made a collect call. And that was July 9th, 1980. And so my first sobriety date was July 10th, 1980. And I, uh, I got seven years. And I... What 90 day treatment and I left treatment high as a kite. Talk about pink clouds. I left there with a ninth step, you know, an eight step lift, a ninth, I'm gonna do my ninth step. I was jazzed. I thought, wow, my God, what opportunity. And I had been doing meditation and I actually 
thought I was Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sincerely, I thought I was going to change the world. This was my calling this, to help people. Oh my God, I was so inflamed with the world was so different. And uh, I was driving my car back because it was out on Hook Canal. I was driving it back into the city in this farmland and I see this tent. Colorful tent in a field and all these cars. What the heck is that? I turned around and drove back and I parked and walked into this tent. And some people are witnessing. There's people standing up. You know, it turns out it's a Baptist revival I've never seen before. And I sat down and I thought, wow, what is this? And I was there for well over an hour. And sure enough, before I left, I was praise the name of Jesus. <laughs> you gotta remember, I was raised atheist. Okay. I was and I still at this point, you know, I'm three months sober, dry. And uh, the idea of a spiritual was still very abstract. Um, uh, but uh, there was something I was connecting on with people in AA and program. But I left, and I within days realized I was just on a big cloud. That I, through my life, it was so weird and so different that I that that morose that was always there was gone. The paranoia, right? That angst that you know something is inevitably going to happen. The bad. That was all gone, but um, I still didn't really have any tools, and so I uh, got another sponsor uh, there. And uh, for the next seven years, went to move meetings at Hilltop. Uh, did what I thought was the right thing. I got married. I had kids. I got a divorce. Hey, jeez, perfect alcoholic in sobriety. I had no clue. Um, and I had a moment, 98 and 87, which was a really, 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 really difficult moment. And I woke up one morning and I thought I had a drunk dream. And then I realized, no, I did. I got drunk. This is a hangover. I was like, what the fuck? I threw away seven years and I couldn't remember why. And again, it was two days later. It was a black, another blackout, a couple day blackout. And then I realized I had thrown away seven years. I had been dry for seven years. I had gone to meetings. I had done this. I'd done a lot of work. And I went back to meetings. And I realized I hadn't been to a meeting in like two years. And I went back to meetings and was going back to meetings again. And uh, I got nine years. Until one night I decided it was a really good idea at my barbecue to have half a dozen tigray tonics. Nothing bad happened. Except waking up the hangover. Again, I realized it had been like five years since I've been doing AA meeting. Start going to meetings again. Another wife. Another divorce. Got ten years. Third wife. Third divorce. A company with 17 people. I just decided to close. The housing thing hit. Bankruptcy, uh, house was seized, and I decided to stay drunk for two years. And I was mad. I was mad at God. I was like, I can't do this thing drunk. I can't do this thing sober. I mean, and so I just I lived in my, my what, what do they call it? Uh, it was in foreclosure for two years. I lived two blocks from a bar or from a uh, where they sell alcohol, uh, the state liquor uh, thing. And I had a wonderful drunk girlfriend. And uh, for two years, I was just waiting to die. And then 13 years ago, I ended up at LIS in Ballard. And I heard that sentence. I heard that sentence. I've been there maybe a few days, and it said my primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics. And I, I, I actually asked myself, what if that's true? What if me, Greg Nyland, that's my purpose? And I started thinking about it that way. And I started realizing that the only purpose I can ever think of having in my life at that point in time, up until that point in time, 
was getting what I wanted. I mean, I had no purpose. You know, and then all of this literature started like just blossoming and, and having meaning that that's all I ever really did. And then I realized I'd never had a service position. I'd never sponsored another alcoholic. I'd never so much as moved a chair in an AA meeting in 34 years. I realized that I wasn't even close to being sober ever. I'd been dry a lot. And uh, my world changed in such a dramatic way that uh, I've been at LAS easily over 300 days a year for the last 13 years. I've held every single service position they have more than once. I'm the general secretary now. Um, I've even tried the GSR a bit, which is not my thing. Um, and I've sponsored. And that purpose now is that everything got simpler for me. The things that we have turned into cliches, which we have out there, uh, are profound to me now. Every single one of them. And uh, they're powerful. I mean, all of them. This too shall pass. One day at a time. Keep it simple, stupid. They are really profound, powerful, just because it's a few words. And I realized that I thought of them as cliches because I, eh, whatever. And I'm amazed that 100 drunks with the sage advice of someone with two years of sobriety wrote this stuff down. I find it amazing today. Because uh, I've been in the GSR meetings and there's only about 15 people there. I can't agree on anything. <laughs> <laughs> so my point being, it, it, there's so many things happening in my world that have, because I don't have my spiritual higher power is without definition. And I, I desperately need it to be a mystery because of my intellectual capacity to manipulate everything to suit my temporary emotional need. And so now I have to trust because I don't know where it is. And I know when I'm in that state, I'm happy almost all the time. <laughs> I wake up all the time and I'm grateful I woke up at least for the last 13 years. And because uh, and of my purpose now, it's just to, to stay sober and help other alcoholics be of service. But it says it's my primary purpose, not my only purpose. I'm not a big book thumper. I don't quote pages because I have a shit memory. But that was the beginning. And then I started looking at my life in general. Uh, what's my purpose to be of service in my community? First, it's my AA community, my home group community. And then it's my community in West Seattle. And then Seattle. And it, so it's like, oh, I can be helpful just by paying attention how I drive and not cause somebody else a bad day, right? And there's so many things, so many little ways that, like I was saying about being mindful, that I had never, never thought of. And, and meetings, which I used to think in all those years of being dry, I stopped going, I know, because I was cured and you were boring and, you know, you're just repeating the same stuff. What they really said was, I don't give a shit about you. Right? I was still a selfish prick. And so coming to meetings was about what can I possibly do for anybody in here? Is there anything I can do? And I don't know. I don't know there's anything I can do. It tells us and, and that what we do is we share our, you know, our extreme strength and hope. What it was like, what happened, what we're like now. And if any of that helps you, fantastic. I mean, isn't that what, what you know, Bob and Bill did? They just talked to each other. And for some reason, they trusted each other. Maybe because they saw each other in each other, right? Saw themselves in each other. And apparently in their life, that never happened. <laughs> and they were, because I know that I'd never been able to analyze myself because I'm biased, right? Biased, I can't see. All those years, I couldn't get this. And the words haven't changed. They're still the same words, right? And yet, now it, it's, it's like, uh, I, I, I am more grateful, it seems, every day. 
And the fact is, I all my life, I had an easy life. I was born in a country club. I was born a rich white man, right? And I managed to, to trash that to the point where I woke up four day blackout. I was going to commit suicide in Honolulu at the ripe old age of 21. So that's my will. That's my capacity. No matter what I told myself, how smart and charming and, and incredible I was. Right? And, uh, and today, uh, it's like being of service. Uh, I've, in this 13 years, I've, uh, well, I was told when I got diagnosed with cancer that I had an 80% chance of surviving five more years. That was like, oh, during my lifespan down to a single digit was, whoa. And for about half an hour, it freaked me out. And I kept thinking that I wouldn't see my youngest graduate from high school. And I was about two years sober, actually sober this time. And for some reason, I calmed down. And for some reason, what I came to the conclusion was, well, yeah, let's say that, let's say worst case scenario, I don't make it that five years. I don't want to be miserable between now and then. And so it just reinforced the fact that what's been working is to be of service and to continue what I've been doing. And, and so I kept doing that. Well, well, that was 11 years ago. I'm five years cancer free. I got cancer, my kidney removed, cancer, my bladder, skin cancer. I've also had spine surgery, shoulder surgery, eye surgery. Uh, we don't even know how. I had a testicle, get a tube in there, get like smashed. I used to do Kung Fu and I recall getting kicked in the groin, but I uh, had had surgery on that. I mean, all of these surgeries, I practically lived at Harborview for, for a big period of time. And yet never once did I feel like I was a victim. Never once did I feel like life's done me wrong. And never once did I feel like I didn't deserve it. It was just stuff that happened. I was actually laughing, thinking it was funny that here I am, I actually get sober, right? And, and it made me think about what an easy life I had. But that's really the point is that it, our emotions and our fears are almost identical. It doesn't matter what the physical circumstances are, right? We don't feel like we can do what's in front of us. We get overwhelmed, we gotta run away, right? And I don't know about you, but I'll call for that. When I get that second one, I don't seem to care anymore. So it's like instant doesn't solve anything. And then there's a lot of the problems that come with it, right? Where's my car? <laughs> I never had Bellevue once. I was in a bar and, and I went out I, and I thought, I want to park on, trying to find my car. I, I called the police. My car's been stolen. <laughs> he shows up, he asked for a description of it, and I told him what it was. And he, it's parked over there. I mean, you're not driving it, correct? Right, and I totally forgotten that I had gone out, got cigarettes, and driven the car back. Right, and I just I think back at how did I survive? What allowed me to make it here? Right, I I totaled a 1977 Trans Am in 1977 by smoking nitrous. I mean, I was inhaling nitrous oxide and passed out in the middle of a turn at 60 miles an hour. And this poor woman driving a station wagon coming to a stop sign, and I came flying around the corner thinking, wondering how fast I could make this corner. And last thing I remember was starting to turn. And apparently that's when I passed out. You imagine this poor woman living her life, coming to a stop sign at five miles an hour, and here's this bright yellow flash of steel flying at her, smashes into her. And of course, when I passed out, that's what caused the crash. My foot went on the accelerator, smashed into her, and off into the woods. Destroy every panel in that car. Nobody got hurt. Miracle. Didn't see it that way. Right? When deer hunting on acid was lost out in the woods in the snow. Almost 30 hours. Did I die? No. So many times. I did things that I'm looking back, 
It's like mathematics says you should be dead. And I'm not. And it's not because I'm clever. <laughs> I'm, I'm as dumb as they come, folks. Even that's not what I told myself, right? I was always smart. And yet I couldn't see the obvious. And that's what, why I come every day because um, I'm still obvious challenged. I still need you and your experiences and shares to keep me in this state. And it's a great state. Right? Is that I don't feel any pressure. I don't feel like I have to perform. I don't feel like, you know, I'm not afraid of being rejected. My peeps. <laughs> right? And, and once I actually took the time to get to know people and care about people, I found that alcoholics are amazing. Sober alcoholics are amazing humans. They have compassion on a level that's, that's like way up here in the registry. And, and the intelligence is always really there. And there's an honesty. And again, that's sober alcoholics, right? I was one that was not sober for a very long time. And uh, so I just, I love being alive today. I really do. And uh, any opportunity I have to help somebody, again, I'm not, I, it's not like I, I, I think early on, I thought, well, I just well, don't want to be a, uh, you know, a big book clumper, like, you know, like, ooh, goody two shoes. And, <laughs> and uh, because some of that came across to me, but I guess some of the people is a bit false. And so the idea of service, I looked at my work and I'm a carpenter and a cabinet maker. And uh, I want to know how I can help <clears throat> in a broader stroke in the world. And I've worked with bamboo cabinetry. Uh, made out of bamboo and engineered bamboo panels. And I believe that it's, it's, we have to stop cutting down trees on this planet. It's how I can actually help the entire planet is to promote the use of this material as a building material. And so I don't know what my tiny little part is in that, but it's like, how can I take the skills I have and apply them in a helpful way? And um, I've been kind of, attempting to make the transition and February 1st, I, I get my uh, new shop over here and I'm percent all in on, uh, on doing the furniture and cabinets out of bamboo. And it's taken me five years to get here, but uh, it was always that thing. It's not my timing. It's still, I still get feedback that I should keep doing it. Right. And I never would have thought that way. I didn't think that way. Right. The only thing I thought about other people was, you either have something I want or you're in my way of getting what I want. I mean, literally, that's all I thought. And yet I was such a terrified human being. I was, I was terrified to be terrified. Right. And that's why I think you come in here and it's like, well, Oh, I got to look at myself. Jesus Christ. Dude, I've been running for myself for a lot of years. I know what's there. I don't want to look at it. And yet that's the freedom, right? Freedom from bondage yourself. I was always stuck because I couldn't let go. And, and I was still using that, that history. And, uh, and today it's, uh, it's so different. Um, I can get excited when it stops raining for half an hour. Right? Like, oh, cool. Right? Little things. Right? I haven't seen any parting of the seas or I don't know anyone with a virgin birth recently, but, uh, you know, there's little things that work that I see all the time and I get to experience. So if you're new, right? Wanting it to be better immediately, you rob yourself of so much, right? Because I did it right now. It's absolutely hard to imagine that I would ever touch a drop of alcohol again. It's just, that's so seems so abstract now because it's just, it's so obviously something that a single drop of alcohol is a stupid thing. You know, it would be 12 drinks, at the minimum. And that is something I just have no desire for. Right. And, uh, but if I don't keep this system, 
uh, in doing it, I totally believe <laughs> that I can convince myself with enough time alone that it's a good idea to get drunk. And to me, that is the nature of alcoholism for me, right? It's, that's why they call it a program of action, right? right? It's doing it. And for me, I mean, got to do it every day. Well, I don't have to, but it's easier. <laughs> it's just freaking easier to stay closer, right? Stay in here. It's easier. And I, don't, I haven't been cheated by life in any way by doing that. As a matter of fact, my life's huge because of it. Right? Someone's like, oh, I don't want to go on the side. Can I go to the evening? Well, yeah, I, I start going too because I had that attitude. But the opportunity to, I mean, you may say something that I never thought of. And it's when I stop being God and start being just a human that I can get that <laughs> and go, but I'm, people have incredible experiences and they're willing to share that with me and I don't have to pay them. I was seeing a psychiatrist for a while there and, and I was got really poor. I remember sending him an email saying, I, I can't afford uh, to do uh, sessions for a while. I never heard from him. He never even acknowledged I sent him the email. And I thought, hmm, yeah, it's about right. <laughs> I saw the books he had in there. I've read half of them. <laughs> and he didn't know shit about alcoholism, right? So, but someone suggested I did it, so I did. And uh, it didn't work out. Am I done? You feel like you're done, sir? Was well, that the time? It is, yes. I can talk forever. <laughs> I, I'm one of those people that ring the bell on. Um, so, uh, there's just so much to talk about. Um, I had, uh, I've learned so much from so many different people that it all comes back. It, 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 my second sponsor, uh, his name was Pete, and he was a hilltopper and big, tall guy, huge, blonde afro, and uh, super, smartest person I've ever met. And he drove a, a lawnmower at a golf course. And we would sit at the Denny's in Bellevue for years till midnight drinking coffee and welcoming newcomers to hang out it was the after meeting meeting and and uh, i asked him one day what i mean you like genius level you could do so many things and he, and uh why are you driving a lawnmower and he said well it gives me enough money to pay for the small little place that i have which is very takes me very little time to keep clean and I sit there and listen to music, and I'm driving around in a park all day. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> right? And it's, it's just, uh, we come in here. I mean, I was, most of my life, I was living my life according to the sage teachings of a 12-year-old drug addict. That's who I sought out for advice, right? It didn't matter what I read or what other people said. I always, I went 1971 to Black Sabbath at the original arena over there. And um, I was, I don't remember any of it. I was so high. I know I went, but like all those concerts, all the big bands, I don't remember any of them. Except for Doobie Brothers, I remember that. But uh, I don't think it's mixed. I went to them four times. I was just, it was oblivion and oblivion. Just shit. And I, I always thought it was a good idea. Right? I was that guy you called if you had a stupid idea. I'd call Grant, he'll go. Right? And I would. Do anything. And I can't, I just, it's amazing I'm alive. And, uh, and it's amazing in, in dry time that I did not commit suicide. Dry. Three marriages, three divorces, and the woman I 
been with my lover uh, when I met, who I met 11 years ago, I was two years sober. And I told her when we first started dating, I said, look, I, I'm not going to be anybody's boyfriend or husband again. It's already been proven to me, but I don't know how to do that. And I'm not going to do that. And we've been together for 11 years. It's the most amazing relationship I've ever had. And it's healthy and it's honest and it's loving and it's given. And she's not an alcoholic, right? She was one of those people that partied through college and all of that and then stopped <laughs> for no apparent reason. <laughs> and so uh, I could go on about how blessed I've been sober. Um, and I don't think it's like a reward. I think it's, I have to continue doing my part. And that's the point is that I have to stay sober or I get to stay sober. I choose to stay sober, whatever you want to call it. It's not something that's handed to anybody. The opportunity is, right? Being dry means I can be clear headed enough to do what's in front of me, right? That's what it is. But everyone has to do their own steps, right? We all have to do that. We have to make those decisions. That's how we become confident because we know how it feels to make the wrong choice or the right choice and what the reaction is. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so that's why I don't hesitate to tell you to fuck off <laughs> when you, you say something that I recognize. And it's only stuff that I recognize is my own bullshit. I can remember telling my son, a teenager, we were fighting, and I'm like, dude, you are literally lying to my eyes, into my face, the exact same lies I told my parents. I mean, identical. Dude, you weren't even alive. How did you get that? Right? <laughs> Bizarre. So, we're done? Excellent. <laughs> uh, thank you all for uh, allowing me to jibber-jabber. And, uh, Thanks,